So when you guys are working through the SOL, you guys will have a formula sheet, which I think I've referenced briefly in Unit 7. So I'll make sure I show you this more in detail when we get closer to the SOL. These are all the formulas and the information you're allowed to have access to on the SOL. I think you'll have both a paper copy and, and an electric copy like built into the testnet program. Uh, but all of the formulas we're about to talk about, except for one, are on here. So you don't have to <coughs> worry about memorizing them. So like the triangle, the square rectangle, parallelogram, trapezoid type stuff. The only one that's not on here is the kite. Uh, we're also going to be learning about something called an apothem, which is how you find an area of a polygon that has more than four sides. So a triangle, you guys know four sides. You guys know pretty well. But what if there's five or more? There's a special formula for that that involves a special feature called the apothem. Uh, but almost all of that information is on here. So you don't have to worry too much about memorizing. So obviously, I'm sure you guys know how to find the area of a square. Right? All, area for a quadrilateral is, in general, uh, base times height. But the base and the height are the same, so that's why it's size squared. So what would the area be for this square? And now, I'm not going to be too picky about this, but they didn't include units, so I write units squared. If they include units, I expect you guys to get in the habit of actually writing the units part of the answer. I'm not going to be picky about that until unit 9 and 10, more so in 10, um, but just get used to that now. Uh, unfortunately, I, the notes don't have any units, so just write U for units if they don't provide them for you. And then what about this one? This one they haven't given you the sides yet. They've given you a diagonal, so you have to use that to help you. So how can I use the fact this is a square and the diagonal is 3 square root 2 to actually get the area? Okay, why? Because the angle is a 90. This one? No, that one. Okay, so I understand this is 90, but why does that make those two 45s? Um, because... The, what do we call this? Yeah. Oh, diagonal. Oh, the diagonal. Yeah. Because this square is also a rhombus, remember we have a special property in rhombus that the diagonal bisects the angle, or the angles that it touches. And so because the square is a rhombus, it also has that property. So those angles are congruent, making it 45, 45, 90. And so this is the hypotenuse of a 45, 45, 90. What are the two legs? Three. So they may throw a wrench at you with that kind of solving process. We have to figure out what the sides are first in order to find the area. So for this one, the area would be just, yeah, just nine units squared. Right? So pretty straightforward. I'm sure you guys have seen that before. Just get used to working with other information to find the sides first. Rectangle, base size height, generic type thing, length type width type situation. So what would the area be for this one? We can do this real quick, guys. 70 squared, this one, 36 root 3 unit squared, don't ever give it to me as a decimal unless I ask you to, so if it starts, if it has a radical in the format of the question, keep the radical there. Again, pretty basic stuff there. Then we have our parallelogram, the uh, formula for a parallelogram is still base times height, you just have to look carefully at what the base actually is in the picture. So because it's been slanted, uh, the base is going to be whatever the altitude is perpendicular to, and the height serves the purpose uh, of the, sorry, the altitude serves the purpose of the height. So 6, if this was a rectangle and it was upright, 6 would be your height. But the 6 is now slanty, so it's, does the 6 represent how tall the parallelogram is? No. So I always use the altitude for the height, and whatever the altitude is perpendicular to is the base. So for this one, it would be 4 times 20, which is... That one's done. Uh, which one would be the base? Which side? Which side in this picture would be the base? It would be this one, which total is 5.5. And then what's the height? What's the height? Do I know it? Not yet. So you need to find it, right? The height is the altitude. So how would I find that? do Pythagorean theorem or just recognize this triple. The of this right triangle, the hypotenuse is five, one side is three, so what's the other one? Four. 
You can do a Pythagorean theorem if you don't recognize the triple, but you'll get four either way. So the the height is four, the base is 5.5, .5, so what would the area be? So be prepared to see that kind of thing where they've chopped up the segment or the side here into two segments and put it back together to get the full base. So be looking for that. All right, what about this? What is the base? It's seven, right? Because this is a parallelogram in the direction, this will say that, is a parallelogram. These two sides are equal, but remember opposite sides are equal too. So this is actually really a rhombus, right, which is still a parallelogram. But all the sides are seven, this is particularly the opposite one, so the base right here is seven. I would not say that the base is ten, because the ten includes this little dot, dot, dot that does need to go out to create the altitude, but this is not a part of the shape. So you would not do the full ten. The only reason why that ten is there is so I know that that little segment is three, and I can use that to help me find the height. Okay? So this is Pythagorean theorem, it's not a triple though. So you'd have to do 7 squared equals 3 squared plus h squared. Find the height. It's not a triple. So what would this be? Simplify it all the way. 2 root 10. Always simplify. So you do Pythagorean theorem, you get that the height is 2 root 10. And so these are the two values I would use for the area, the height of the parallelogram times the base. So what would my final answer be? 14 units. <coughs> so make sure you guys are careful when they give you the full extent from one end to the other end, including the dot, dot, dot. Don't include that invisible little section, only do the, the highlighted section that's actually part of the shape. All right, triangle, I'm sure you guys know this one. Half the product of the base and the height. Again, the base has to be perpendicular to the altitude. So the altitude, this perpendicular is the height, and then whatever is perpendicular to is the base. So I would do one half, 10 times six, which would be what? Got it out. 30 units squared. Just because the 12 is on the bottom does not make it the base. Okay, just because the side is on the bottom does not make it the base. Don't make that assumption. All right, what about over here? It would be 1 half. What's the base? 5. Not 5 plus 3, just the 5, because that's the only uh, part of the triangle that we're looking at here. And then to find the altitude, which is the height here, how would I do that? Pythagorean theorem. Again, that's why they gave you the three. They didn't give you the three to add it on to find the base. They gave you the three so you can find the height using Pythagorean theorem. And so if you do eight squared equals three squared plus h squared, h is root 55, which can't be simplified. Okay, so there are two ways you're gonna write the final result here. One is highly preferred over the other. You could just multiply five and one half together and get 2.5. We don't usually write decimals attached to radicals. So the better way of doing that is just like we were saying with special right triangles. How can I write this as a fraction where it looks neat and organized? Yeah, five root 55 over two. That's the best way to write it. If you guys write it as a decimal, I mean, I won't be heartbroken, but this is the best way to write it when it doesn't divide you. Because it's 5 times square root of 5 divided by 2. So that's how you kind of take all those ideas and put them together. All right, everybody clear so far? All right, our last one is the trapezoid. This one I'm not sure if you guys have seen before. The other one I know you have. This one I'm not completely sure. The only thing that's different here, this is actually still the idea of one half base times height, but because there are two bases, you have to add them together. So uh, for this one, it would be one half times the height, which is 10 times the bases, because there are two of them. So you would add them together, the 15 and the 27. 
Thirty-two. Nope, forty-two. All right. So then, what would the final product be if you do one half times the height times the base is added together? Five times forty-two. Two ten. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. All right. What about this one? I have the one half part. Do I know what the height is? Remember, the height has to be altitude, straight up and down. Do I know what the height is in this scenario? Now that's this, how would I find it? Uh, well, base angle is the difference for triangles specifically, but what are you trying to say about this? Okay, so because this is an isosceles trapezoid, if the base angles are congruent here, it's an isosceles trapezoid. So that means that these legs are congruent, meaning this is 13. And so you guys can use Pythagorean theorem again over here to find h, or this is another triple, actually. All right, 5, 12, 13 is a Pythagorean triple, just like 3, 4, 5. Um, so the height would be, if you again, if you don't remember the triples, you can for sure just do the Pythagorean theorem really quick. But the height is 12, and then what would be the other number I would use? What's the next number I would use? What, what are the two bases added together? The, this base is 20. It would be 31. So when you do this is 6, 6, 10, 31 is? So the minor diagonal is going to be 6. And then what would the major, how do I find the major diagonal? I know part of it's 10, that longer section is 10. Does that mean that the whole thing's 20? Is the major diagonal bisected? No. So how do I find this little segment here? Right, so remember, property of a height is that they're perpendicular, so this is a right triangle, and it's, in the, it's that Pythagorean triple again. The hypotenuse is 5, the leg is 3, so that means this one's 4. So it's the full length of the major diagonal. So you're going to do 1 half times 6 times 14. Which gives you 42 units squared. Alright, this kite, the little markings, all these little sections are 4. Then what's the minor diagonal and the major? So you're going to do 1 half times 72. Okay, so that is the one formula you will not have access to. You need to remember that. I don't know if they're going to ask you a question about the area of the kite, but just keep it. All right, this next concept that involves the apothem. Uh, this is how you would find the area of any polygon that's going to be more than three or four sides because we have special formulas for the party. If it's a pentagon or above, you can't use any of those other formulas we were talking about. And so the formula, which we'll get to, is fairly, it's simple. It's just one half times the perimeter times the apothem. The, the thing about this question is, though, that it, they're not going to give you the apothem up front. So it does take a little bit of work sometimes to find that. Um, but just to define this word, an apothem of a regular polygon is the distance between the center of the polygon, which is a point right in the middle, 
the center of the polygon and the midpoint of a side, any side really. So this is an illustration. So it goes from the center down, it does have to be perpendicular, but it's gonna go to the midpoint of one of the sides. And so I draw these little markings here to show the midpoint that would be significant as you're moving forward with this. Uh, but you can draw a, an apothem in any shape. Of that you could draw one in a triangle. It goes from the center of the triangle out to the midpoint. Right, it goes to the midpoint of any side. It doesn't have to be this one. It could be the bottom. It could be the side. Whatever uh, you want, left or right. You could go up. Like this. You could go to the left. Doesn't really matter. You can draw the pop them anywhere. It goes from the center to the midpoint. And that's what we're going to be focusing on for the formula of area for these uh, polygons. But Sometimes they don't give you the apothem. Sometimes they give you other things and you have to find the apothem yourself. So one of the other things they could give you is the radius. <coughs> I know you guys have only heard of radius in terms of circles before, but polygons can have a radius too. Because if you can imagine a circle, and that's why they have to be regular. If you can imagine a circle being drawn either inside or around the outside of these, uh, I'm going to try, it's not going to look very good, but if you can imagine a circle being drawn, right, is this radius... A radius of the circle. Yeah, so it's also a radius for the polygon. Okay, so a radius of a polygon is the distance between the center of the polygon and a vertex. So from the center to one of the little pointy parts of your polygon. And again, you can do that for any shape. Center out, center out, doesn't matter. As long as you're going from the center to a vertex, that is considered a radius. So they could, instead of giving you an apothem, they could give you a radius and expect you to find the area that way. And there are ways that we can use these different parts of the picture that they give us to find the apothem and their perimeter to move forward, but it does sometimes take a little bit of work. Something else that I uh, accidentally left out of the notes, another thing that you guys may need to consider is something called a central angle. I'm going to draw, you guys can draw it kind of like do this if you want to, since I accidentally left it out. So a central angle is just an angle that's inside of a polygon where the vertex of the angle is at the center, hence it being called a central angle. <coughs> so if you guys have, and the sides need to be a radius, so you have two radii, these two radii meeting at the center creates a central angle, okay? And this is going to be significant to help us in a little bit, because sometimes you need to use a central angle to help you solve for the apothem. And there, uh, the way that you find a central angle is to divide 360 by the number of sides that you have, which will give you one of them, okay? So draw this little illustration, draw a little arrow, because I accidentally left that out. But again, a central angle is both of these two are radii meeting at the center creates a central angle right there, okay? Great, right, now with that vocabulary out of the way, let's look at a couple examples of polygons. So again, the formula for the area of a polygon is one half times the perimeter times the apothem. That's what the P and the A stand for. All right, so looking at this picture right here, do I have the apothem? Is it physically drawn? No. No, what do I have instead? Vertex. A radius. I have a radius here, okay? Radius. But I need to have the apothem, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it. I may not include it for you, but you need to draw it yourself. And then also remind yourself that the apothem does have that midpoint aspect. All right, I'm going to label this with an A. I'm going to need to solve for that. I'm also going to need to find what the segments are around so I can find the perimeter. But all I know right now is the radius. Okay. When you guys have that, this is a right triangle, so obviously I'm going to be using unit 7 stuff, whether it be Pythagorean theorem or special right triangles or trig, I don't know yet. Um, but I'm going to be focusing on the right triangle. Do we have any rules that let you do anything if you only have one side? Can you do anything with just one side? No. Um, I don't know the apothem. Is there any way to find the other side here? No. So I, I that rules out Pythagorean theorem. Because in order to use Pythagorean theorem, you need at least two sides, right? So I can't use Pythagorean theorem. Um, for the other two, the trig and the special right triangles, what else did I need besides just a side? An angle. So that's where this comes in, central angle. Okay? 
So for the central angle, I'm going to need to use that. Now I'm going to draw, I don't want to muddy up the picture too much. I'm going to draw this and then I'll delete it in a second or I'll erase it. Um, so in order to create a central angle, you need two radii. So I'm going to just illustrate that here. Now to find this central angle, again, you're going to divide 360 by the number of sides. So how many sides do I have in this guy? Six. All right, so one central angle, this one that I've illustrated right here, one central angle is 60. I actually have six of them. I'll draw these all and then erase them. All right, I have 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60. That makes the full 360. All right, I only have one of them, but do I have a full central angle? Do I have a full, is this angle right here a full central angle? How much of the central angle is it? It's only half. So if I get rid of this, and this right triangle I have, what is the measure of that angle? 30. That's how the central angle helps you. Okay? If you have two radii meeting, that's the full 60, but the apothem, because it cuts the segment in half, all right, it's also going to do the same thing to the angle, so this is 30. So now what do I have? I have a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. Okay? With a hypotenuse, that is 8. So what would this little segment be? Think of your rule. That's L, and if this is the hypotenuse, which is 2L, what is the length? 4. And what is the length of the apothem? It would be the rule is L root 3, and if L is 4, the apothem is 4 root 3. All right. Now, we previously said that this was bisected, right, by the midpoint. So if this little segment's 4, that means this is also 4. So what's the full length of the side? 8. So what would the full perimeter be? It would be 8 6 times or 48. It is a coincidence that the hypotenuse and the leg are the same measure. That will be true if this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle here. It won't always be it's because it's a hexagon that it works out this way. But don't think that just because the radius is 8 that the side lengths have to be 8. It's not always the case. Often it will be, but not always. Alright, so now the formula is just 1 half times the perimeter times the apothem. The major work is figuring out what those are, and then you just simplify this. So it would be 96, I believe. 96 root 3. Get it squared. Alright, so that's how you would do a polygon question with more than four sides. Okay. Next up, we have this one. What have they provided for us? Have they given us the apothem? Have they given us a radius? No. What have they given us? Side length. A side length of the actual hexagon. Okay? So I got I got nothing going on for me here inside <coughs> this triangle except for what? Well, I can find that. Okay, so what's the perimeter? 120. So I got that part. I still need to find the apothem though. They've drawn the apothem. How can I use the 20 to help? Okay, so remember all the sides are 20, including this right here. This is 20. So then remember, what does the apothem do? It's bisects, right? It goes, it has, it connects the center to the midpoint. So what are each of these little segments? Specifically this segment, which is focusing on the triangle that they've drawn for us, is 10. Um, okay, I don't know, I don't know what the apothem is. I don't know what the radius is, but I can find something else about this triangle. Say again? Central angle. If you kind of imagine another radius drawn here as a central angle, this is a six sided figure, so it's one central angle. I don't have the whole thing though. So what's this? 30. 30. So again, I have another 30, 60, 90, and that will happen if it's a regular hexagon. Not pretty much always. Alright, so this is a 30, 60, 90. They've given me L, side right here. So what would the apothem be? It would be what? 10 root 3. All right, because remember the rule for this side is L root 3, and they give us L across from the 30. So this would be 10 root 3. So I have everything I need to plug into the formula. I don't need to know what the radius is. You don't have to keep going and figure out that that's 20. It's not really helpful here. The area is 1 half the perimeter times the apothem, giving you 600 root 3. Now those were both hexagons where it was nice and pretty where the central angle was 60 and then divided in half that was 30 so it was a nice and handy 30, 60, 90. That was all nice and pretty. 
What if it's not a hexagon? What if it's a pentagon? Okay. So what have they provided for us in this picture? That's the apothem. You do need to know, but we also need to know what? Perimeter. So somehow I have to use the apothem to figure out what the perimeter would be. Now in these other examples, what shape did we use to help us? What? Triangle. We use the right triangle here. So I'm going to draw the radius in. You don't necessarily need to find the radius, but you want to draw it so it completes that triangle. So I know the 12, but remember, in a right triangle, knowing one side is not helpful. And I can't find the other sides. I don't have enough information. So I need to focus on trying to find an angle. If I were to draw both of the radii here, I would have a central angle. But what would the central angle be worth in a pentagon? The full central angle would be 72, but I only have half of it. So when you draw this triangle right here, that angle that was a 30 in the hexagon is a 36 in a pentagon. Does everybody see how I did that? Okay. So now can I use the 30, 60, 90 rules? No. What would I do instead? Trick. The angle, I have one angle one side, the angle is not 30, 60, or 45. So I'm going to be using trig. I need to find this here so I can find the full length of a side, which will help me find a perimeter. So what function would I use? Tangent. I have opposite and adjacent, so I'm going to be doing tangent of angle 36 is equal to opposite over adjacent. So I just need to find the value of 12 times the tangent of 36. Okay, 0.72. Now that's x, which is just this. Remember, for the perimeter, I need the whole thing. So I can do five of those. So it's the full length, half of it, per the apophic rule. If half of it is 8.72, it's the whole thing. I need five of those to find the perimeter. Okay, so now I have the two things I need for the formula. One half times the perimeter times the apothem. And then I can find the root. What's the result for that? 523.2. Okay. So that's working with the apothem. Yes. So be prepared to see that and be able to work with it using Pythagorean theorem, potentially, trig, special right triangles. Be prepared for that. Now, I thought that they had the equilateral triangle formula on here. They used to, and then they took it off, which is interesting. Uh, this uh, formula right here for the equilateral, you can derive it. You can derive it from the apothem thing, sort of. Uh, I mean, you don't see this a whole lot, but just so you guys are aware, the formula for this is the side squared times the square root of 3 divided by 4. I like to remember it because it's 2, 3, 4. Right? It's just 2 is a square, the 3 is in the square root, and the 4 is in the denominator, but it's 2, 3, 4. Um, so that's our formula. If you guys see an equilateral triangle and they want to know its area, yeah, its area, you can do that using the formula. If you're desperate and you forget, you can always draw um, an altitude like this. Do Pythagorean theorem to do 1 half base times height, and you'll get the same answer. So if you're desperate, you can go the long way. But this formula works the same, so the side... Um, is 10. If you square that, you get 100 times root 3 divided by 4. Those cancel, you get 25 root 3. So it's, it's a lot faster to do it that way if you remember the formula. And then over here, um, it is isosceles uh, with the 6 here, so I bring another 6 over here that's just to illustrate that that one is also equilateral. This will only work if it's equilateral. Okay? And then that one would be 36 root 3 divided by 4, cancels, 9 root 3, Great. Right. So again, this is just kind of a backup. If you guys see equilateral 
double triangle and you don't want to do the draw the altitude and then do find out what the height is, do one half base times height like you would for a generic triangle, you can for sure do that. Um, but this is just a kind of shortcut for that. Alright, so that's the area of formulas you guys are responsible for. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to the last concept? The last concept we're going to talk about besides area is how to work with polygons on the coordinate plane. Sometimes, well they're going to ask the same kind of questions that we've seen before. Here's a shape, what kind of shape is it? Uh, you had questions like that on the homework where I showed you shapes that had special features like the opposite sides are equal and asked you what kind of shape was it? Is it a parallelogram? Is it a square? Is it a rectangle? They're going to ask you that kind of stuff um, on a coordinate plane as well. You guys need to be able to draw them on the coordinate plane and then based on nothing else except for what the vertices are, you need to figure out what kind of shapes they are. So you're going to be using the distance formula potentially to check to see if sides are congruent or diagonals are congruent. You could be using the midpoint formula to check what the midpoints are to see if they bisect each other with the diagonals or something. Uh, probably the most important one is the slope formula where you guys can check to see are the sides parallel in the first place to check to see if it's a parallelogram. Are the sides perpendicular, the adjacent sides perpendicular, meaning that they create 90 degree angles? Are the diagonals perpendicular, like in a rhombus or a kite? Uh, those kinds of things are going to be significant, and that's what you would use to figure out what kind of shape it is. Okay? So we're going to do some practice with that. And then they also have these kind of questions on here that I'll talk about in a second. All right, so let's go ahead and plot these points. So I have one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. 5, 2, and 3, 1. So I have this shape right here, and I'm trying to figure out what kind of shape it is. So the first thing that you guys want to do is figure out the slopes. Because, again, slopes is going to give you the most information. So I'm going to draw little arrows, and I'm going to write the slopes for all four sides. Starting with this one on the left. What's the slope of this side? It's up 1 over 2. And for this process, you don't want to simplify the slope fraction ratios because it'll be more helpful if you leave them unsimplified. What about this one? <coughs> negative, so you drop down go over, so that's negative one half. This one? Up, one over two, and then this one? Negative. So those are all the slopes for all four sides. What you should notice immediately is that opposite sides have the same slope. So if they have the same slope, what do you know about opposite sides? They're parallel. So both pairs, right? Both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. So what shapes can I rule out? What is it not? It is not a trapezoid. It's not a it's not a trapezoid or a kite. It's not a trapezoid or a kite. Because a trapezoid only has one pair of parallel sides and a kite does not have any special cases where it's a rhombus, but we've kind of ruled out that definition of a kite. So what we're working with is parallelogram, rhombus, rectangle, or square. I'm trying to figure out which one of those it is. And so now that we have that, we have to narrow it down. Is it just a regular old parallelogram, or is it a special one? Now the next thing you guys can do, you can go in a couple different directions. You could use distance formula to check to see what the side lengths are, see if all the sides are the same, making it a rhombus. Um, you can check, well, Here's my next question. Are the adjacent sides perpendicular? In order for the adjacent sides to be perpendicular, what would need to go on with their slopes? <coughs> they would have to be opposite reciprocals. But this is just opposite. Does it have the reciprocal? No. So if adjacent sides are not perpendicular, meaning they don't have 90 degree corners, what other shapes can I rule out? Square and rectangle are out. So now I'm just tossing up between a rhombus and a parallelogram. So I need to figure out, is this a rhombus or is it a parallelogram? So there are two ways you can do this. One is a lot faster than the other. If you're trying to see if it's a rhombus, shouldn't all four sides be the same? Okay, so you can check to see using distance formula to see if the side lengths are congruent. What's another thing, what's unique about a rhombus that a parallelogram does not have? Diagonals are perpendicular. Diagonals are perpendicular would be the easiest thing to check because perpendicular has to do with slope. So look, one diagonal is horizontal, right? The other diagonal is vertical. What's the relationship between horizontal and vertical? They're perpendicular. 
So if you were to imagine the diagonals in here, they're perpendicular to each other. So what kind of shape would this be? A rhombus. of why you know why the shape is what you chose. So I usually I show my work for what the slopes are, and I say, okay, the sides are parallel and the diagonals were perpendicular if you draw them in, so that makes you promise. Right? You could obviously go the direction of checking to see if adjacent sides are congruent as well. You don't have to check to see if all four sides are congruent, you can just do two. If you prove that adjacent sides are congruent, that's enough to show as a rhombus because in a just generic parallelogram, the opposite sides should, should be congruent with the adjacent ones. So you're going to have to do all four. You can just do two adjacent ones. All right, next one. Negative 2, negative 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, and 2, 1, 2, 3, right here. Got this guy. Again, first thing you want to do is check slopes. That will give you best insight. Again, don't subdivide them. So what would this one on the far left be? Don't subdivide them. And no, it's not negative. Up 4 over 2. This one is down 2 over 4. This one is up, two, up 4 over 2. This one's down 2 over 4. Okay? So what can I say about this? What can I say about the opposite sides? The opposite sides are parallel. So again, what two shapes can I rule out? <coughs> Trapezoid and kite are gone. I know that opposite sides are parallel, so it's a parallelogram, square, rhombus, or rectangle. Now, look at the adjacent sides. What's going on with their slopes? They're opposite, They're opposite reciprocals. So now what are my two options? Square, rectangle. How do I figure out which one's which? Or how do I figure out which one it is? Side lengths. Okay. You could do side lengths. You could check to see if the diagonal, you could check to see the slopes of the diagonals again. See if the diagonals are perpendicular. That's another way you could do it. Just find the slopes of the diagonal to the center. You could use the distance formula to find the length of two adjacent sides. Again, you don't have to do all four. If you can prove the, that adjacent sides are congruent, not just opposite ones, that would make it a square instead of a rectangle. I'm going to go with the diagonals one because I feel like it will be easier. Distance formula is slope. So this diagonal here, you go down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and over 2. So that's one diagonal. And then this one, you go up 2 and over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you go up 2 and over 6. So what's going on with the diagonals? <coughs> Opposite reciprocal. So what does that mean about their slopes? They're perpendicular. So in this shape, the diagonals are perpendicular. Does that happen in a rectangle? No. no. Which one does it happen in? square. This one is a square. Again, because the uh, there are parallel sides, uh, perpendicular corners, and perpendicular diagonals. All those together show that it's a square. This is something you guys need to get used to using as well. Sometimes you can't just use slope, sometimes you have to use distance formulas, so just be prepared for that kind of thing too. Alright, these questions are a little bit different. These are going to be asking you to find coordinates, like they have the picture on here and they have some of the coordinates already. They're asking you to kind of fill out the information to match what shape it is that they're telling you it is. Um, so this is like kind of backwards to what we were just doing. So these want to find the vertices of the polygon. So this one is describing this length, SQ, is 2A. So the whole thing is 2A. Um, and then it also says that the axes, these right here, bisect the sides. So I can say these have been bisected. These have been, well, hold on. Oh, this is a square. Sorry, so all of these are equal. All those are equal. So I want to know what the coordinates are for each of these. And I'm using A as a reference. What are the coordinates in terms of A? The 
this is 0, 0, the origin. If this whole length is 2a, how can I use that to help me? Think about it. S to Q is worth 2a. We have all these bisecting things going on. Yes, okay, all the sides are 2a. It's not quite the direction I was wanting to go in, but yes, that's true. All the sides are 2a technically, yes. Okay, so each half segment is worth a. That's where I was going for. The full thing is 2a, then each little segment is a. Um, and now I need you guys to write the coordinates. So what would the coordinates of q be? If this is the origin, what are the coordinates of q? Yes? A, A. You go out A and up A. Okay, there's some arbitrary number. I don't know what it is, but we go out that much and up that much. What about R? <coughs> uh, you still have to be valid for the coordinate plane. A, negative A. You go out A and then you go down on the coordinate plane, it's negative. You go down, so that would be negative A. What about T? Negative A, negative A. And then S? Negative A, A. All right, so now this is arbitrary. They're just treating A as some number. You guys have to come up with what the coordinates would be based on that value. OK? So you have to pay attention to, to that as you're writing those coordinates. All right. All right, this next one, we have an isosceles triangle, so that means that these are going to be equal. Okay, isosceles. Ti, this thing right here, the segment is 2a, and then they're saying that the y-axis is a median. I reintroduced the idea of median to you guys before as well. So, you guys remember what a median does? The y-axis right here is a median to the triangle. What does it do? Bisect the line. The bottom line. Yeah. So median goes through the midpoint, goes from the vertex to the midpoint. It will not always uh, bisect the angle. This happens to you because this is an isosceles triangle. But the main, the definition of a median is that it for sure bisects the opposite side. So now I need the coordinates of I, R, and T. Oh, and you can, we're going to call, if you don't have, like, A is talking about this section. If you don't have a definition for the upward direction, because this is going horizontal, you can make up a new new variable. So I'm going to call the, the height B. Because the A is referring to horizontal, I could switch it to vertical for the square, because the, si the horizontal and the vertical sides are equal. But over here, I can't do that. So if you can't transfer the A going horizontally, you make up a new one. All right, so what would I call I? It would be A0, A0. Because remember, the whole thing was 2A, so each little half is A. So from the origin out is A, and didn't go up or down at all, so it's just A0. What about this one? Negative A0. And then R? 0B. Zero B. And again, if you can't transfer the A term upwards to the vertical dimension on the coordinate plane, you can make up your own variable for that. All right, so I know that's a little bit abstract, but you guys get, need to get used to seeing that kind of thing. All right, similar but a little bit different how we're going to do these next two. They want you to write the coordinates for point P only, so that's here in this picture, here in this picture. And you are not allowed to introduce any new variables. So like we were doing over there when we didn't have the vertical with the B, you guys cannot introduce a new variable. You can only use A, B, C, um, and either of them. Okay? Now, they're saying that this is an isosceles trapezoid. So what does that mean? So 
also the trapezoid means that these are equal, right? It also means we have equal angles, right? But I need to know what this point would be. This point right here is A comma B. This point right here is C zero. I need to know what P is. Yes? Say one more time. C is a little bit further out than P is, so it would not be C. You got the B part though. At least we can say that much, right? We know that this is level because it's parallel, right? It has to be level with B, so the Y value is going to be B. You know that much. But the X value is not C because C is further out past P. Yeah? No, A, B is right here. A is the distance from the origin to here. You know, points, right? You go out X and then up Y. So they're saying you went out A and up B. Yes? Yeah, it's C minus A. C minus A. Because C is all the way out here, but I want to back up a little bit. But because this is isosceles, remember that this, if you guys were to draw this, this little segment here should be equal to that little segment because that's how an isosceles trapezoid works. It should be equal as you're going across. It should be symmetrical. So if I'm going out to C, but I need to back up a little bit so that's straight here, I'm going to back up by the amount of A. So you backtrack a little bit. Okay, so that one did take a little bit of thinking about the fact that it's isosceles, backing up from C instead of just calling it C. So yeah, you might need to use some sort of expression, like C minus or plus or half or something like that. Um, so this one would be C minus A comma B. All right, what about this one? <clears throat> this is a trapezoid with a right angle. So that would be like here and here. Yeah, that one was easy. A zero. Yeah, it would just be A zero. That one was easy. This one would just be zero, zero, so you kind of gave that one away by getting that one. But yeah, so some of them are really straightforward. You can see them pretty easily. Some of them you have to really think, all right? So just be careful with those ones and use the property of the shape to get it there. All right, question? 